Lane Montgomery grew up in North Carolina. Liberal family, growing up during the, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, seeing all that there was of the, the Civil Rights Movement happening uh, around her. Um, about 30 years ago, she, she moved to, to New York and then started traveling around the world, uh, doing something that I think so many of us would would like the opportunity to do, to, to see the world. But what she was looking for was really injustices in the world and, and photographing those injustices. Um, and one of the things that really had an impact on her was when she went to Rwanda and saw what is happening there. This is, is her book, Never Again, 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 with her photographs, and you will see her, she'll be talking and showing some of her photographs. And I wish I could say that these are, are just beautiful photographs. The, the more appropriate word is they are haunting photographs because of the story that is behind those photographs. Please join me in welcoming Lane Montgomery. I began to photograph and write about genocide when I went to Rwanda for the International Rescue Committee, the IRC, and arrived in its capital, Kigali, at 3 a.m. on the wrong date due to international dateline change. Nothing nor anyone could have known what I was going to face that morning. No one met me in the airport full of armed Hutus staring at me. I was the only woman in the airport. A young boy approached me and I grabbed his arm and he took me to a car. We were chased after by two of the Hutus. This boy, Cecil, 16 years old, barely knew how to drive and spoke no, nothing but French. With my foot over his on the accelerator and literally panicked, believe me, one's French comes back to you. Not, <laughs> perhaps not with the right verb, but it returns. That aside, what was the real lesson from Rwanda? Was it to rescue before it's too late? Or was it to watch mass killings through binoculars? or to wait to understand the difference between Hutu and Tutsi? Was it to look back and worry about the failure in Somalia so as not to repeat it again? In Rwanda, everyone was killing the other one, and then it was too late by the time Secretary of State Warren Christopher had the courage to come forward and say the big bad word, genocide. Still today, we hesitate to use that big bad word about the Armenians, while in France, the denial, denial of that word causes either imprisonment or 54 euro uh, thousand pounds, I mean 54,000 euro or imprisonment. At the Nuremberg trials, Ralph Lim uh, Raphael Lemkin's birth of the word genocide sentenced the Nazi denial and they were hanged. Today the Cambodians are finally having a tribunal to punish the survivors of their autogenocide in their country 35 years later. Few are alive to be punished by now. Also today, Ratclaw Maddox still enjoys the restaurants in Dubrovnik. I know, I had lunch across the room from him there. He was an attractive man enjoying having lunch with a friend and after personally ordering the beheading and bloody butchering of some 6,000 husbands, sons, and brothers in the United Nations safe zone of Srebrenica overnight. Then one did not have to shout to be heard on the subject of Bosnia. The name alone evoked the rapes, torture, burned villages, and mass grave of a genocide in which roughly 100,000 people were killed between there and Sarajevo. Now, seven years later, most of the slaughter in Darfur has ended simply because there are too few people left to rape and kill. The International Criminal Court has sent an arrest warrant to al-Bashir, the president of Sudan, but the ICC does not yet have the power to extradite a criminal. Today, the Congo is the latest cauldron of hell, the fire curtain that hides the past and the present acts of rape and murder, and the smoldering revenge between Hutu and Tutsi. I was in Zimbabwe in 2000. I went out in the fields horseback riding with a guide. I was just enjoying the freedom of riding in open fields, hoping to see some game. But too soon, a fire broke out in the fields, and before I knew it, it we were encircled by a ring of flames. The smoke was irritating, and the guide said we had to go back to camp. The horses were acting up, and I was very glad to return to camp. When we dismounted, I asked the guide what all the fire was about. He seemed uncomfortable, but asked him that it was only crop burning. I replied that I was from the southern part of the United States, and I knew something about crop burning. It didn't look like that. It was not under control. 
That night at our camp, I went to the friendly bartender and asked him about the fire. He just laughed and said he thought it was nothing to worry about, that we should have another drink. We did leave the next day. At the Harare airport, we saw many white elderly, Brit elderly British people being nudged ahead with rifles. Some of the Zimbabwe military had guns to shove them with. Once the plane took off, I spoke with several of the former farmers who had spent their life and their children's lives farming the land they owned in Zimbabwe. They had homes and land and under their names bought when the country was Rhodesia. Now under the direct of Robert Mugabe, they were to leave or be killed. The women were crying. They had already sent their children back to the UK. They had no future. Robert Mugabe brought Zimbabwe from poverty to prosperity in his early years and then destroyed it in later years with his manic arrogance. He became a thug, smashing people and their countryside with his police squads who murdered their own people. After he threw out the foreign whites, he watched the natives of Zimbabwe starve to death due to inflation that he brought on. At the UN during the Circus of Clowns a few weeks ago, Christian Amandpour interviewed, interviewed Mugabe. He made no pretense that he would ever change. After all, he is 87 and remains a killer. Zimbabwe is not legally a genocide. Starvation takes a little longer than machetes. My hope and perhaps fantasy is that never again we'll stop adding agains. The reason for my book is that someday we will learn to prevent genocide before it happens. And now I'm going to show you a few photographs. Get this one. That is the cover of the book, and I chose it because it looks to me like innocent looking at it evil. You can't really tell what nationality the boys are, but it, it's, they're shocking. I remember them looking at it, and outside of the front of it is his contributions, which I cropped out. I'll go to the first slide. I'll read you something from the priest Krikoros Malakian wrote. He survived the uh, Christmas Eve slaughter in Armenia. The Armenians were very wealthy, uh, organized philosophers, very smart, intelligent people and businessmen. It seemed on this one night all the prominent Christian Armenians of Constantinople, teachers, attorneys, doctors, merchants, and bankers, had made an appointment in those dim cells of the prisons where they were brought. Some were still in their pajamas, their robes, and their slippers. When we were taken to a special train waiting to take us to the depths of Asia Minor, where we, we would, but a few, meet our deaths. With the lights out and the doors of the car shut, the train started. And so we began to move further away from the places of our lives, each of us leaving behind grieving and unprotected mothers, wives, children, and sisters. We headed to regions unknown and un unfamiliar to be buried forever. This is the Armenian children uh, lining up at the, uh, they're, they're called Orphan City, and that's where they were fed. And the photograph is taken by Armin Wegner, who was a German officer in the war with, on the side with Turkey, and he realized what was going on. He took photos all over Armenia and was, went through seven concentration camps for it, survived, and moved to Italy. Well, that's, a, you know, something I've got to go back. Okay. This is um, Leningrad during the starvation there, the book 900 Days by Harrison Salisbury. And you see the sled, it has a, a corpse on it. It's probably the corpse of a child. The elderly and the children starved first before the middle-aged people did and they were dragged on their own sleds to the cemeteries outside of Leningrad. This is from the book, The 900 Days. It's just a short quote. Marina slogs back to the hermitage in a whiteout of snow. She struggles from one lamp post to another. She steps on something. She loses her balance. A bundle of rags, half hidden under the snow, lies at her feet. Suddenly an arm extends the claw that was once a hand, and she feebly clutches the hem of her coat. Marina begins to lose her thought pattern. She looks at the heap and sees the eyes staring. The bundle is a woman. 
Marina knows that she cannot live with herself unless she tears the foil open on the chocolate bar in her pocket. She breaks off a jagged piece of the dark chocolate, peels a frozen scarf away from the woman's mouth. The mouth falls open and Marina places a broken square of chocolate on the woman's tongue. This you all recognize, I'm sure, it's actually Birkenau, which is the sister camp of Auschwitz. And a week before the book was sent to the printer, I realized that I had taken a lot of camps in Latvia and Lithuania with my friend Daniel Mendelssohn, who wrote the book, The Lost, but that I had not really done as much of the better known camps like Auschwitz and Birkenau, Belzec. So I flew over to Krakow, and at 6.30 in the morning, it was in the summer, and I lay down on those tracks, and I took that picture, and I really couldn't take it anymore when the black raven started coming. There was no one there. So I took the one picture. It was the most depressing place. And I remember I cut my finger and I thought, I've got to get out of here. So I went back into Krakow to a, a film shop. I was using film then. And asked the man to, uh, to develop the film and waited. And he came back and he said, if something's wrong, you only have one photograph here. The rest of it's black. I said, thank you. Took the film and returned home. The next one is, this is awkward, but wait a minute, Cambodia. This is a picture, a photograph that I took, and I feel that the integration, you can feel the presence of the interrogation that took place in this room, because that was what was the room was for. It was the torture chamber in Tul Sling Prison, just as it was left by the guards who fled from there on January 7th, 1949, when the Vietnamese freed Cambodia from the Khmer Rouge. The evil that took place there, I think, is still lurking in my photograph. And I'll give you a quote from Francois Bizet, who was attaché to the French ambassador at that time, which I think is lovely about Cambodia. So the gate does not open on the agonized cries of the tortured in tool slung prison, but on to absurdity and despair. The soldier lying there is the son of the brother or the uncle of someone you know, the lover of the woman you came across blown to bits by the side of the road, wearing the new sarong she so carefully chose at the market this morning. Uh, this photograph is mine, and it introduced me to the beginning terrors of Rwanda. It is the first church I entered about 30 kilometers out of Kigali, the capital. I was unable to take this picture for a while because I did not want to believe what I was looking at. The bodies were left as they were when they were macheted. Ladies' purses like someone's grandmother's, high heels and pieces of ragged clothing still hung on the skeletons. The Tutsis hid here in that church where they believed they would be safe. Their pastor turned them in for cash and the ability to escape. Today, Rwanda has been restored by women and teenage children who, with the help of NGOs like my dentist, who works with Paul Farmer at Harvard, they have built, rebuilt schools, churches, and entire villages. This is a photograph that I took of Camilla Omanovic in Srebrenica, who lost her husband, Ahmed. She's sitting beside his mass grave. I had a translator with me for most of the day there. The Bosnian Serbs had invaded the UN, United Nations safe area called Srebrenica under the command of General Ratko Matic. De he demanded the, Dutch UN, the United Nations Dutch peacekeepers to surrender or face his firing squad. He also demanded them to take off their clothes and give them to the, the, um, the Serbs.
The fall of Srebrenica's safe area is the largest massacre in Europe in 50 years. Camilla told me that through a, tra that through a translator that when hope dies, one has only hope to find remains of their dearest. I remember leaning down to take her photograph and just as I was about to do it, she said, this is my Ahmed. He's here without his head. And, you know, you just go on. But This is the photograph that I did not take of the Janjaweed, which is entitled, A Man Without a, With a Gun on Horseback Coming to Kill. They are members of nomadic Arab tribes that have been at odds with Darfur's settled African farmers. Both groups are all Sunni Muslims. This wonderful photograph was taken by a noted photographer, Ron Haviv, who works with an agency called Seven. It's sort of the new magnum. He took this at the very beginning of the disturbance in Darfur. The lineup is of 14-year-old girls who've all been gang raped. And he asked me not to even name which, not that we would remember or know, which camp that was. And it was the very beginning of the Darfur genocide. Obviously, this was recent. The very word genocide horrifies Kenyans to be being viewed by the world as a stable democracy, an investment opportunity, and tourist destination. Yet Nairobi and the Rift Valley exploded into a genocide in January of 2008, killing over 1,500 people, harboring churches, and displaced some 300,000 by burning their homes. The killing was not spontaneous, but the result of systematic violence by politically motivated tribal militias. The police also perpetrated the killings along their tribal lines. This photo shows a policeman coming into the house of a rival tribe to kill. A child has opened the door. By late February last year, Kofi Annan, the former United Nations Secretary General, was able to effect a power-sharing deal by the leaders of the two rival tribes by making the former president prime minister. Yet today, the Financial Times writes, now all tribes are in the ruling class and it has not brought any relief between the rival leaders. I am going to end with this new law that is at the United Nations, which I don't think alone is going to help. It's called the Responsibility to Protect, or e R2P. In August of 1992, presidential candidate Bill Clinton said, if the horrors of the Holocaust taught us anything, it is the high cost of remaining silent and paralyzed in the face of genocide. Yet this is precisely what happened on his watch in 1994 when over 800,000 Tutsis were killed in eight weeks. And it has continued. Genocide is often used as a tool for staying in power by those already in power. On the face of it, a commitment by all 192 United Nations member states to reach an understanding on how the world body should intervene to stop genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing, which to me seems somewhat the same, should not be a major stretch. In 1999, the Secretary General Kofi Annan brought up the evil of the choice of standing by and watching when mass atrocities were being formed, which brought about this document named Responsibility to Protect, commonly known as R2P. That was a decade ago. And what has changed? What has changed is that now the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon speaks to transform R2P from words to deeds by stating, it is high time to turn R2P into practice. Why turn our common effort to curb the worst atrocities in human history into a struggle about ideology, geography, economics, or agriculture? What do they offer to the victims of a genocide? Rancor instead of substance, rhetoric instead of policy, despair instead of hope. But the debate in the General Assembly this past July over the concept known as R2P was produ producing discord before it even started. It must be realized that the UN is ill-suited to rapid response missions for reasons that are unlikely to change. If these moral and correct obligations are being respected and acted upon, then we must have a Security Council that is not on board for its own enrichment. It is high time to turn the promise of R2P into practice. I go a little further after all these years and call it R to prevent, resolution to prevent. By now, I believe that there should be an international genocide armed force stationed in Brussels or at The Hague near the ICC, which is the International Criminal Court, and has now got some muscle. 
This force should be supported and contributed to by as many countries as possible. It could replace the UN peacekeepers, whose own lives are constantly threatened and often taken. At the very first sin of genocide, this international force would move in with diplomats who have experienced former genocides and attempt to stop the oncoming wave with diplomacy. If violence should erupt, the diplomats will be protected by the international general force to exit. But the force would stay on to prevent first and then to protect if necessary. And I end with a quote from President uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda, who has done an amazing, amazing task by bringing this country back to, to complete safety and British buying condominiums there. Armed intervention might be the only way to curtail the violence of genocide. In situations where institutions have lost control, I would not mind such a solution. In the wake of senseless killings with no immediate solution, if anyone suggested a military option to me, I would agree. Those who injure ge genocide don't want to work things out. Lacking both empathy and contentment, no language is going to stop thugs who sm smash and kill with pleasure. How many genocides have been stopped by mediation? Decent men want peace. I just don't believe that peace can be without justice, nor justice without peace. And in my last comment, I would like to read a quote by Nick Kristof, who sums it up for me completely. He's written, as some of you may know, so much on this subject, but there's one comment here. But there's something special about genocide. When humans deliberately wipe out others because of their tribe or skin color or anything else, when babies succumb not to just diarrhea but to bayonets and bonfires, that is not just mere tragedy. It is a monstrosity that demands a response from other humans. We, de we demean our humanity and that of victims when we continue to avert our eyes. That is all. Thank you all for being here, for coming, for listening. Are there any, any questions? and Lane's going to repeat them just so that we can get them on this camera. Uh, but one of the things I want to take a, the privilege of, of asking you one question, uh, because I, when I was with CNN, one of the, my colleagues was in Sarajevo and ended up a photographer got shot uh, in the head uh, at the time and survived. And so I, I know personally what this is like. How do you get countries, whether it is this country or other countries, to feel it is their responsibility uh, when there is genocide in the world and get them to not feel, that's not my problem, that's somebody else's problem. I don't want to give the lives of our young men and women to somebody else's problem. I think the only way you can do that really is to get an international armed force to replace the UN peacekeepers. And they are paid soldiers, they have equipment, and they are stationed somewhere in Europe, as I said, in The Hague or Brussels, not in the UN. Perhaps they could be attached to NATO or the EU, because it's an international thing. It's not an American problem alone by any means. And I, th I think, and I've talked to people, I think there are a lot of countries that would rather do this than pay United Nations dues to have an international force that can do something. Uh, uh, right, what in the paper yesterday, day before this, uh, talk of Guinea blowing up rapes in the street, shooting people in the head, and a force would be in there today if, if we had one. Other questions? I wanted to um, address the uh, Holocaust in Rwanda and ask you to describe the role of the church, and I'll single out to uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, what I'd like to do is to contrast the uh, role of those churches uh, domestically in the Rwandan Holocaust and then internationally if there was any international implication. Your question is to explain the churches that existed in Rwanda at the time of the genocide and how they helped or did not help. Is that right? Well, frankly, most of them did not help uh, because the pastors were just as frightened as the congregation if they were, and most of the congregation was Tutsi. They were very, they were very Catholic. And uh, as I mentioned in the, my statement, one of the pastors, which is a very well-known scene, took cash and disappeared. 
and the people were thought they were safe in so many churches, I went through a great many of them, and, and also schools and universe, small universities. Terry George and I went to a technical university. We couldn't even stand in the door more than a minute. There must have been 8,000 skeletons in there that were kept with lime covered over them. And in each instance that I know of, uh, they relied on someone, whether it be a teacher or pastor, to hide them, and they were never hidden. I don't know of any that were not found. And what are you going to do when 50 people come in there with machetes? Other yeah. questions? Sir? The, uh, even though the Armenian massacre took place under the Ottoman Empire, it's illegal today to, to talk about genocide in Turkey about it. And then all the promises to the Armenians the UN had didn't happen. And I understand Hitler actually said, see what happened to Armenia, nobody complained. We can do the same thing here. This, have you thought on how to, how to deal with Turkey even today? You're asking me what we can do to deal with Turkey today about admitting that they are grown up now and that there was a genocide a long time ago. Um, they're not grown up. And I think that under George Bush's administration and possibly under this one, we want the Turkish air bases. And the only person that called it a genocide, I think, was George W. Bush that I know of. His father didn't. Clinton didn't. And it hasn't been in Obama's statements now yet. Um, it's kind of childish. And it's sort of saying, like, you know, we know there was slavery. My great-grandfather could have had one. I have no idea. But no one's trying to pretend that it didn't happen. And Turkey's a wonderful country, sophisticated. Uh, the Armenians were a wonderful, sophisticated civilization as well. And it would be so much better if they could get along, because Armenia is now shrunk to this compared to what it was. And the Turks, I was told when I wrote about this that not to give a web page because it was going to be uh, ripped over by, by young Turks, and I was going to have to get an IT man every other day. It's never happened. But I know things that have happened in Barnes and & Noble and other places where the young Turks, right, right after uh, the editor's death, I don't know if you know, there was an editor of a paper in Turkey, in Armenian, and he was shot in the head after being warned. So it is a very troubling situation, and I, one can only hope that they just grow up, because, you know, it's a fact. Next. The, um, the armed force that you were suggesting could uh, do a lot to prevent further genocide that doesn't exist, but you said should. How, how, in your idea, would they be funded? Would it be through taxation of countries that support it? Your question is, would the International Armed Genocide Force be uh, paid by taxation? No, I didn't have further taxes in mind. I think that, um, just for instance, this thing I just mentioned happening in Guinea yesterday and the day before is as recent as one can be. If we had an international genocide force, they would be in there already. And what it, I think it would take the place of the peacekeepers. So they would be paid. You know, this, these genocides are known about before they actually occur. Uh, sometimes years before, like in Rwanda, they, Mitterrand and Chirac were involved in that. So I think that it takes a long time to plan a genocide. It doesn't happen overnight. It seems like it does. So this international force working with diplomats in those countries and in, at, in the ICC, the International Criminal Court, would be able to get information before the public or the newspapers or anything could. And they could go over there with diplomats and start talks saying, just about like we said about Iran, we know you have a camp here. We know you're building a nuclear bomb. We know you're planning a genocide. I'm talking about to prevent, because it's very expensive with lives and money to stop it once it has occurred. And I, I wouldn't suggest doing that by taxes. I think a lot of countries be willing to support uh, that force, which would probably be, could be a thousand people. Yes? Uh, but that doesn't, does that imply then the United Nations is becoming irrelevant if you're going to create another group because the UN is not doing their job? I mean, that, that's what it seems to me that you're implying. Instead of maybe creating another uh, another entity, why not just modify what we already have in the UN? 
Why not modify what we already have in the UN is your question. Well, what do we have in the UN besides peacekeepers with binoculars? Well, that's, that's my question. That <laughs> they don't work, and well, they, so they lose their lives. So, so does that mean that the United Nations is really irrelevant then? Well, not that, that's not my place to say it's irrelevant because oh, okay. in, in many instances, after things calm down, they have a great deal of humanitarian aid they give, uh, medical aid they give, agricultural information, taking care of people once something is over. But that's at the end of the saga, not the beginning. I'm trying to say, let's don't have them to start with. And I don't think the United Nations does a good job with that because what can a peacekeeper do if he's watching a rape scene or a murder, wave his binoculars? I mean, there's really not much he can do. He's in danger himself, and, and often they are killed. Yes? What have you observed in your travels to these various places about how uh, governments or, or societies choose to remember or not remember these, these, uh, these places? And I think it's one of the places. Did you have free access? Were there memorials? Uh, were there museums that were there? Um, how, what did you observe about how they remember or not remember these things? Your question is, how do people in the countries that have the genocide remember them? Is that right? Well, now there is a genocide memorial museum in uh, Rwanda. I'm sort of glad I was there before because I don't think I would have been taking pictures under glass in a museum. And you lose so much of the awfulness of how serious this is if you go into a museum and take pictures. Um, there's a wonderful memorial in Armenia, which is outside under Mount Ararat with an eternal flame. And a lot of people go back there at certain holidays. I don't think memorials can give you the true experience of what happened there. I think you have to read about it or know about it. That's why I did a photograph book. I, 41 of the uh, photographs are mine and the rest are given, donated to me or from Getty with whom I'm, with whom I'm assigned. But uh, most of the times people want to forget and that's okay if it just doesn't start up again. I think Rwanda's incredible what has happened there. And they did free the 7,000 prisoners who were waiting for trial because they couldn't feed them anymore. And uh, they're out running around free, sort of makes you mad, but at the same time, they're beginning to try to work to help their families to make up for what they did. So there is some feeling of healing there. Yes, to you and first to the cat. Um, which countries, in, in your opinion, might have the will to move forward with this force that you suggest because um, it seems that uh, the United States is unwilling to act. Uh, the Europeans uh, let former Yugoslavia happen on their doorstep, did nothing. Uh, the uh, Russians and the Chinese do business with uh, some of the regimes that commit genocide. So where, where is this force? Going? Well, don't forget there are 192 member states at the UN and 150 of them agreed with this uh, resolution to protect, which changes the UN body a bit. I, I know I have heard that Scandinavia, Norway, those countries, I certainly think America would participate. Uh, France, U UK, England, uh, Scotland, I think there are a lot of countries that would participate. No, I don't think China would. I think Japan might, uh, and I certainly don't think Russia would. I could be wrong, but China is the one getting most of the metals and oil out. I don't think Russia is importing much from, from at Africa at all. And I, the, the, the North-South Sudan pact starts, it has to be redone or whatever it is, in 2011. And they're thinking that's where the trouble started of putting them together, of separating the North Sudan from the South Sudan, taking some power away from al-Bashir and leaving the Southern Sudan free to manage themselves. That would help. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear about your path as a photographer and how you came to focus in this area of genocide. I, don't, I can't answer that question because I really don't know. A funny thing happened last week. A friend of mine, uh, Michael Connors, was reading some Star, William Stein short story book that I'd forgotten I had. And he said, do you realize you wrote genocide in the margin of this book in 2003? And I said, no, 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 I didn't. And he said, it was your handwriting. <laughs> and it was about, uh, it was about, uh, Styron was talking about the Nat Turner's, the slavery situation. And I don't know why I wrote the word genocide by that. I, I, it was my handwriting, I don't remember it. But the, I guess what really started it was the trip to Rwanda. 
I was already in Ethiopia on an AIDS situation for IRC, and they called me and said, could you go over there? It's the 10th anniversary. And there were tons of newspapers, and Hotel Wanda was, was being shot, and it was a very interesting time to be there because everybody fed off of everybody else. And so after that arrival night, after that, everything was fine. Does that answer your question? Sir, could you say something more about the IRC? You mentioned that two or three times. Uh, could I say something more about the IRC? I have to repeat my question for him. Uh, the IRC is called the International Rescue Committee. And it's been, it started in World War II in uh, Marseille. And there was, I can't think of the man's name that it started, I'm ashamed, but he was uh, from Boston. Last name was Fry, Varian Fry. And he had a great deal of money. And it said that he was a manic depressive and he had nothing to do in life and he was bored. And so he decided during this war to go over and rescue any of the uh, Jewish artists that he could. He had put a lot of money, you know, very generous to the museums in Boston. And he hid under the steps. He had a place under the steps in Marseille and really risked risk his life. And he never was caught. And he got so many uh, people out, not just artists and writers and musicians. He got common people out as well. But his great thought was to get those great people that could go on and write and participate in the cultures of theirs. And he was very successful. He got thousands out. And then they opened an office in New York. And Varian Fry came back home and killed himself, which is unusual. But at any rate, they, started, they, had started, they kept the IRC going. And they've had different people for five, 10 year terms. And, and I know a few of them. And uh, that's, uh, that's it's still there on 42nd Street. And they, they do a lot of work for food, clothing, and, and they co-pilot co with, the, with the UN on things like that. Uh, was there a reason you didn't include uh, the killings under Stalin? I did, <laughs> on page 193 to 194. You know, it's all in there. I got a fax from someone, Tony, who wouldn't get it from saying that I, in my presentation I didn't, but the man hadn't seen my presentation and read the book. But Stalin's picture and the famine or the, the green problem and the genocide of 8 million Ukrainians uh, and the Kulaks is, is, is in the book. We do have the book for sale out in the, uh, the lobby. Lane will be signing copies of the, uh, the book. Please join me in giving Lane Montgomery a good hand. Thank you.